And I would say the same thing that James just said. That was, that was very good singing. I, I, uh, <clears throat> I've said it before, and I'll probably say it again before time is over. Uh, I, I enjoy hearing everybody. <clears throat> That's a good thing. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse number 1 and read down through verse number 11. So if you would, uh, let's stand together as we read our text. Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least... Uh, among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we are thankful for each one who's here. We thank you for uh, the opportunity we have today to be able to meet together and to be able to look into your word and see what it has for us. And Lord, I pray that as we look at your word, that every one of our hearts would be open before you, that you might be able to have your will and way in each of our hearts, in each of our minds, in each of our lives today. Lord, bless in this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We want to consider this afternoon a gift for the Savior. A gift for the Savior. You know, uh, it's always exciting to come to this time of year when gifts are exchanged with friends and uh, those we know and love. And you watch the kids. <clears throat> I'll never forget some years ago. Uh, it would have been before, yeah, that bothers me. So uh, it would have been before my wife and I uh, were married. Uh, it was, um, my nephew was almost two, I think. So he was, he was to the point of talking to some degree. He could walk and that sort of thing. But uh, anyway, so that Christmas, we were at my grandparents, and he got his first gift. And he got, I don't know, a Taka truck or something, you know, a dump truck, some sort of truck. And so he was playing with that. He thought that was great. And my dad, his granddad, said, Now, Ross, here's another gift. I don't want it. <laughs> and he kept saying that all the way through. I don't want it. Uh, he was so caught up and so excited about the one gift, he didn't care about the rest of it. <laughs> now that he would think that way today, I would be shocked. But uh, anyway... <laughs> That's, that's how kids are. And it's fun watching kids, you know, as they open their gifts and different things. And, and uh, uh, you know, it, it's fun even watching my kids when they were younger. Uh, they still do this to some degree, but it's not exactly the same. But I've watched them, especially like on a birthday. So <laughs> mom and I, that is Becky and I, we're trying to get pictures of the boys opening their presents and we can't hardly do it for the other two standing there so close they want to see what it is and they're so so excited and it's not that they want it they're just so excited about there's a there's gift that we don't know what it is and we need to find out and this is important to us and and uh you know that, that's just a, so much fun uh when, when we can do that and when we can see it but you know in, in our gift giving uh we need to be careful not to be guilty of giving some of the worst gifts ever. And uh, as I was studying, and, and I do this, I do this really to kind of bring some humor because there, 
it may be lacking a little later. Uh, but this came off of um, the Good Housekeeping website. They have an article about like the 31 worst gifts ever, and some of them I didn't think were so bad <laughs> myself. But I'll give you I'll give you four of the 31 that they have. Just just throw them out there. Number one, exercise gear of any sort, any kind of exercise gear. We all have at least one friend who's obsessed with fitness, this is what they said. But you don't want to risk unintentionally insinuating that she needs to lose weight. That's a good way to lose friends, not to impress them. Uh, here's another thing, and I actually, I've seen this happen before, and you probably have too, and that is gifting someone a calendar from the year you're giving it. Now when you do that at Christmas, you know what you've done. Enjoy it for the next six days because then it's no good. You know, otherwise you can frame the pictures and put them around the house if you want. So that was the second one. The third one, which I, I thought this was humorous, is cleaning supplies. Yeah, that's uh, your favorite cleaning tools and sprays might put a smile on your face, but your friends and family are going to wonder what you're really trying to say uh, if they were to open them as a gift. And yeah, I can, I can see that. Uh, and then the, the fourth one, I thought this was uh, also humorous, uh, that is clip-on hair extensions. <laughs> I don't need them. Uh, anyway, I don't know anybody that's, you know, that's right there at the top of their wish list. I would love to, anyway, let's go on. Uh, but as we think about giving gifts, and what are we going to give? And that, that's, you know, that's the thing. Uh, Becky and I have been sitting around uh, and, and we've been talking about, uh, you know, what are we going to get? What are we going to get for the boys? What are we going to get for her mom? What are we going to get for my parents for Christmas? And all that sort of thing. But here is one thing that we need to ask ourselves. And that is this. What am I going to give to the Savior? What is the gift that I'm going to offer to the Savior? And I think that that is a valid question and something that we want to deal with. Now, I want to jump on a rabbit trail for just a second because I, I want to um, just sort of lay this out there uh, as far as the context here of the text. There are a lot of people who hold to the idea uh, that the wise men met Jesus at the manger, and that didn't happen. So I just want to make that clear. Uh, we know that because in verse number 11 it says when they were coming to the house. Well, Jesus being born and laid in a manger, guess what? Most people don't have a manger in their <laughs> house. You know, if you know what a manger is, that, that's a trough. It's a cattle trough. You don't put that in your house. Most people don't. Maybe you do. I don't. Uh, but anyway, it's found in a house. Rather, he was found in a house, Jesus was. And also, another thing that it does differently here is it calls him in verse 9 as well as in verse 11, it calls Jesus a young child instead of a baby. Yeah. And so that also tells us that this, this is not when Jesus was born. This is some time later. And then also the other thing that is a clue to that is uh, we, we read in uh, verse number 7 how that Herod asked these wise men, that uh, what, what time they had seen the star. And, of course, they, they told him because they had no idea what was in his mind. And then in verse 16, you find that King Herod sends out a decree to kill every child in the city of Bethlehem from age 2 and under. Again, that tells us Jesus was not a newborn here. Yep. Otherwise, there'd be no need to start two years and go down. Uh, just no need for that at all. Another thing... <clears throat> That, uh, that we can learn uh, just, just from looking at this is that there were not three wise men. Now that, that's another of the traditions. There were three wise men. Yes, there were three gifts but there were not three wise men because Jerusalem that was, <clears throat> that was the capital of Herod's kingdom and he being a king under the uh, or by the pleasure of the Caesars and so that was his capital. The capital city is not going to be set in an uproar over three people coming to town. That's sort of like, you know, when we moved here, there's five of us. When we moved to Edmonton, being the capital of Alberta, they didn't have a write-up in the paper about us. 
they have still yet to call our number. And I'm still waiting on the welcome wagon to show up. Now, I'm, I'm kidding about that, but you understand what I'm saying. There had to be more than three. It had to be a good group uh, in, in a large group. So anyway, that, that's just a sideline uh, that, that I wanted to sort of touch on so that we're all kind of on the same page and we all understand where we're going with this. But the thing is, what have I given to the Savior? What am I going to give to the Savior? Again, verse 11, and when uh, they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So if, if we want to give a gift to the Savior, what is it that we could possibly give? The first thing that we really want to consider, if you look over at Luke chapter 15, we're going to look at uh, verse number 10. And the first gift that anyone could possibly give to the Savior is the gift of joy. The gift of joy. Because in Luke chapter 15 and verse number 10, the Bible says, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And so uh, there's that gift of joy. And in, in making sense out of this, uh, in putting all this together that the Bible has to say, the Bible tells us that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. In Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 11, the scripture says, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? You see, God receives no pleasure. There's no joy for God to have someone who is wicked die. He receives no pleasure in that. And I tell you this, as God's people, if we're saved, for us to derive any sort of pleasure out of anything bad, and I'm not just talking about death, but anything bad happening to people who do not know God, there's something wrong in our own heart. That, that should not be our response at all. But uh, it, it, what the Bible tells us is that the wicked will not spend eternity with God. There, look, the idea that eventually everyone is going to go to heaven, eventually everyone is going to be in the presence of God, that's man's idea. You know why that's man's idea? Because man does not want to be responsible for his sin. He doesn't want to take care of his sin. He wants to continue in his sin and then pat himself on the back that he's pretty good because God's going to take him to heaven anyway. That's silliness, and that is not what the Word of God teaches. What the Word of God teaches is that the wicked will spend eternity in hell. Well, this is Christmas time. We're not supposed to talk about it, but it's still true. In Psalm 9 and verse 17, the Bible says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. So it's the wicked that are turned into hell. Now, before we get all excited about this, let's define terms. Who are the wicked? Who is it that is wicked? Now, we're going to look at the scripture. If you want to look over in the book of Psalms, chapter 10, or the 10th Psalm, either one. Uh, we're going to look at a few verses here. And here in this Psalm, the Lord talks about the wicked, and it describes them for us. It defines who the wicked are uh, to us, and it gives us an understanding. It's interesting how so often we like to define words. And we like to define words according to what's going to benefit us, according to what is going to make us look the best. Uh, when actually God defines things for us in his word, all we have to do is look. And we find that. But here in verse 2 of Psalm 10, we find it says this, The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. So, first of all, the wicked are those who will criticize those less fortunate than themselves. Not only criticize, but they will actively do things against those who are less fortunate than themselves. Shall we talk about young people in school? Because when I was in school, in elementary school, I was not the most well-off in school. In fact, I was one of the least well-off in my particular school. And uh, people would make fun of me because of the clothes I wore. 
People would make fun of me because I brought a sack lunch from home and I didn't get to eat in the school cafeteria with the, the hot food and things uh, that they had there. And what was going on? They were criticizing someone who was less fortunate than themselves. What does God say that those young people were? They were wicked. That's what they were. And look, that is just a very basic illustration. As we look around us, all around this city, you look in your own life, you need to be careful that you're not in the same boat. Also, look at verse 3. It says, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. So not only are the wicked those who criticize or persecute those less fortunate, but the wicked are also those who have a concern for no one but themselves. All they care about is themselves. You get out on <clears throat> you get out on the hen day, and you find out real quick that everybody's in it for themselves. <laughs> is this not true? Now, what does uh, what does the handbook and, and <laughs> don't answer this if you haven't read it? What does the handbook say about entering? a highway or any limited access road. When entering, you are to yield to the traffic that's already on the road. What do people do when they get in on the highway? Yeah. Oh man, they gas it and they cut people off that are already on the road. Oh, I gotta get in here. And, and the thing that I love, there's the sign that says the road is gonna narrow down because of construction. So what do we do? We get over because we're smart. What does everybody else do? They give it gas, they run up to the barrier where they can't go any farther, and then they expect somebody to let them in. <laughs> what are they saying? I don't care about anybody but me. That's what they're saying. And again, I am using an extremely basic illustration to show you what God says is a wicked person. So who's wicked? Wickedness, we say, oh, wickedness, oh, that's a horrible thing, that's a murderer. That's not what God says. The things that we call little sins and really not that big a deal, God says that's wickedness. Let's go on because we're having so much fun. Look at verse 4. It says, The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. So what do we find about the wicked? They have no inclination to submit to God or even acknowledge his existence or power. They have no inclination to submit to God. God says, but they say, but I feel. But I think. I've always heard that is someone who is living in wickedness, who has that idea. Oh, but they're good people. But God says, look, we know what the scripture says. Let God be true and every man a liar. What God says is right. What we think needs to adjust to what God's told us. Then look in verse 5. Talking about the wicked, it says, His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth, puffeth at them. So the wicked are those who con are constantly hurtful. That's the word grievous, what the word grievous means. It means hurtful or harmful. They have no con concern about the pain they've caused. None whatsoever. They don't care. Because, again, going back, what we already talked about, all they care about is themselves. So if they've got to hurt somebody else, if they've got to, do we not have this in, uh, you know, in, in uh, a lot of people's careers? They don't care who they have to step on to get the position they're looking for? Yeah, it's true. They'll lie on their coworkers. They'll do anything they have to just to, to get what they want. That's wickedness according to God. And God says he has no pleasure in their death. God also says he has no pleasure in their life, in their living now. In Psalm 7, verse 11, God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. He's angry with the wicked every day. He doesn't simply ignore Say, well, you know, that's them. That's just their personality. That's just their culture. That's just the way they are. It's fine. You just have to learn to overlook things. God doesn't do that. God doesn't have to do that. Uh, and he doesn't do that at all. In fact, on the other end of the spectrum, the reality is that God tells us that 
God's wrath abides, present tense, on the wicked. Present tense. In John 3, in verse 36, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So God is not pleased with the wicked. There's nothing there. He's not pleased in their death. He's not pleased in their life. But if they will turn to Christ, that brings God pleasure. Because then God is able to display his mercy by restoring the fellowship that has been broken between himself and someone who has been wicked. And see, he can do that. He can restore that fellowship because he's already done everything necessary to restore fellowship in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there, he's already done everything there is. And, uh, and so then God is pleased when the wicked surrender to the offering of God's Son so that they might be saved. In Hebrews 10 and verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then God will forever rejoice in this grace and mercy uh, that saved a wicked sinner. Ephesians 2 and verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So you say, what is it? What is it that we could give as a gift to the Savior? The very first thing is the gift of joy. And the gift of joy by turning from our sin and turning to Christ as the only hope of salvation that we have. Because there is no other hope for salvation. It doesn't matter how good you are because look, we already talked about these things and what it means to be wicked. You know, that person who cuts people off in traffic, they may give all kinds of money to charity. They still cut somebody off in traffic. So as far as God's concerned, they're still wicked. You don't, you don't compare. You don't weigh out things. God doesn't work that way. If you're guilty, you're guilty. There's no, there's no uh, extenuating circumstances. There's no, well, but I did this and I did that. Just, just imagine someone who's on trial for murder, and uh, and and everybody knows they're guilty. Even they admit that they're guilty. Yeah, I, I did it. I, I killed the person. Uh, but you don't understand. I gave all this money to charity. What do you think the courts would do at that sort of defense? <laughs> well, I know what the courts should do, but uh, sadly, uh, sometimes courts take are taken in by those kind of defenses. God's not taken in by that kind of defense. No. You see, if you're guilty of being wicked as God defines it here, God has no pleasure in that. And you are guilty. And only Christ can make a difference in your life. And that brings God joy, that you would trust Christ. But let's talk about the believer's gift for the Savior. And, and again, here in verse 11, it says, When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had uh, opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So just think about that. There, there was gold, that's of course the most precious metal uh, that, that this world knows. Then there's frankincense, which is a dry resinous substance in pieces or drops in a pale yellowish white color. Has a bitter, acrid taste and very flammable. It's used as a perfume. I don't know why you'd want to eat it if you're going to use it as a perfume. Anyway, I don't know. But then there's myrrh. And that is a gum resin that comes in the form of drops of various colors and sizes, a pretty strong uh, but agreeable smell, they say, and a bitter taste. Uh, it's used as a medicine for, for a lot of different things. You can use it as a medicine. And uh, so we'll, we'll kind of tie that in here in just a minute. But their motivation, what was their motivation? Because they said, when they first came to Jerusalem, we already read it back here, when they first came to Jerusalem in verse 2, they said, where is he that is born, king of the Jews? And so what they were doing is they were bringing gifts that were appropriate for someone of that station. They were looking to bring something that would be appropriate for a king. So they weren't trying to be cheap 
They weren't trying to get away with, uh, uh, well, you know, I haven't used this or I, I've used this and I, I'm done with it now. So now I'll give it to Jesus and, and see what he can do with it now. Uh, we, you know, that, that's not what they did at all. Uh, I, I've mentioned before years ago when, when I was young, my dad pastored in Michigan. And uh, we were going to uh, bring in secondhand clothing to send out uh, to uh, one of the reservations there in the U.S. where we had a, a missionary that we supported. And uh, we had to we had to look through those clothes. By we, I mean my dad and mom, because I was too little to do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had to look through the clothes, and we threw out probably half of it because you have you know socks with holes in them, you have you know underwear, and who wants secondhand underwear? Mm -hmm. Don't raise your hand, please. <laughs> uh, I mean, just you know, you've got pants with the knees ripped out. This was the '70s. That wasn't popular then. You know, it's not like today where you could, you know, put it on eBay for 500 bucks and sell it. And, and uh, you know, it was just what it was is people said, oh, we can't use this anymore. Let's take it to church. You know, they can get a lot of good out of it. And what I'm saying is when we bring a gift to the Savior, we have to remember who we're bringing it to. And we are bringing it to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he deserves the very best that you and I have to offer. He does not deserve to be given our leftovers and what we don't want anymore and what we don't care about anymore. And I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I'm going to repeat this before we're done, I promise you, because this is something we really need to get a hold of. So let's think about some things uh, uh, that we can bring to the Savior. First of all, think about a gift that we can bring to the Savior. It has to be something that we have. It has to be something that we have. You cannot give something that is not yours. For example, I cannot take Noah's suit that he's wearing and give it to Lacon. Say, here's a suit for you. I am giving you this suit. It's not mine. I don't have it. And if I say, I really would like to give him a suit, but I don't have one, then I can't give him a suit. I can't give him one of mine because three of him could fit in it. And that would be embarrassing. But what we give to the Savior has to be based on what we have. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12, the Bible says this, For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. So we give the Savior something that we already have. Now, look, what are we doing in salvation? We're giving God our sin. We already have that, and we have that in bounty, don't we? We're also giving him us, our whole being. That's what we're doing in salvation. We have us, but we're giving that to him, and that's what we ought to do. Uh, but then we also need to give of that which we have. Then, secondly... Uh, when, when we're thinking about what am I going to give to the Savior, not only does it need to be something that I have, but it also needs to be something worthwhile. Again, the best we have to offer. The wise men did not go cheap. They didn't give Jesus brass. You know, brass, if you, if you polish it rightly, it can sort of look like gold. They could have done that. See, I mean, it's good enough. It's similar enough. They didn't even go silver. Silver's expensive. But they didn't even do that. They went to the most costly thing. Something that was worthwhile. Not something cheap. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24, if you remember the context, God is judging Israel because of David's sin. And uh, here's the, the angel of death going through the nation, and he's coming to Jerusalem. And David sees this, and he wants to offer a sacrifice to God uh, as, a, as a way of essentially uh, saving the city from destruction, uh, from, from the uh, angel of death there. And so he goes to this mount, which ended up being the temple mount, if you follow the story along. Uh, and so he goes there, and here's this guy, uh, his name's Arona, and uh, he's, uh, he's a Jebusite. He owned that land, 
And the king says, I need to buy this land. Not only the land, I need to buy the threshing floor, and I need to buy your oxen because I need to give an offering to God. And Arona, the guy, says, I, I'll just give it to you. I'll just, you do whatever you want to do with it. I'll give it all to you. And here's what David said in 2 Samuel 24, 24. And the king said unto Arona, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. You see, there's a principle there. What we offer to God ought to cost us something. It ought to be something worthwhile, something that's precious to us. We ought to be willing to offer to God. And, and the thing is, I've already said this, but Jesus is worth more than our leftovers more than what we've used up, more than what we're done with and we don't need anymore. So now we'll give it to Jesus and boy, haven't I done Jesus a favor. Again, he's worthy of so much more than that. Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. The third thing we see about this is that as we give a gift to the Savior, it needs to be given joyfully. You know, I have to give this. That's not what God's looking for. I have to. You know, I'm being forced to. 2 Corinthians 9, 27, or 9 and verse 7 says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And so it needs to be given joyfully. It's hard to appreciate a gift. Have you ever received a gift from someone and they didn't act like they really wanted to give it to you? <laughs> you know, I've had that happen, and, uh, and, and I've been tempted to say, no, thank you. You just go ahead and keep it, because obviously you didn't want to give it to me in the first place. Um, the Lord's the same way. We ought to be joyful to give something to the Savior. But if not, he's not going to be pleased with that. He's not going to be pleased with that at all. Then not only that, going on and thinking about the next thing, when we give something to the Savior, it needs to be offered from a clean vessel, something that will offer a sweet aroma to the Savior, like, like the frankincense. And what do you mean from a clean vessel? I mean our life ought to be the kind of life that is clean before God, that is holy before God, that He will be pleased with that he will see and it will be as it were a sweet aroma to him. In 2 Corinthians 2.15 For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21 says If a man therefore purge himself from these he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified in meat for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. You know garbage that is burned does not produce a sweet smell. Have you ever done that? <laughs> I, I have it one time or another in my life. And, uh, yeah, you get, you get rotten food and you try and burn that. You just want to run away. Uh, you don't want to stand there and make sure everything burns. and Oh, it's, it's horrible. But when we try to give a gift to God and our life is not right before him, that's the same way to God. It's as if we're burning garbage to him. It stinks. And he's not pleased with that. So we need to have that clean vessel that we're using to offer. And then it needs to be also offered as a benefit, not only to God, but often as a benefit to others. Just like the myrrh that is used for medicine to help others. In Mark 9 and verse 50, salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. So when, when people see our love for the Lord, that can have a drawing effect, uh, drawing them to the Lord, and that's a good thing. And then not only that, but people's lives can be healed or restored as a result of what we're giving to the Savior because it has an effect on them. And we can, we can these are just principles I'm throwing out. I'm not giving any, you need to give this, and you need to give this, and you need to give that. Uh, the Lord needs to lay that on your heart. I am going to get into some specifics in some areas. But uh, we can see these things in uh, these gifts in a lot of different areas. First of all, in our goods, our material things. Sometimes we can give that to God, and we've talked about that. But also in our gifts, that is our talents, our abilities, 
we ought to be willing to use of our talent for God. If God's given us a talent, we ought to seek to use that for him. And then in our grant, that is in the time that we have. Um, we all have seven days in a week. We all have 24 hours in a day. None of us have any extra time. We're not allotted any more time in the day or in the week than anyone else. And we all have to be careful with the time that we have. The psalmist said this, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And we need to redeem the time, as Paul said in the book of Ephesians. And, and that means to make use of our time. Say, well, I want to I want to give something to God. We can give God of our time. Well, I don't have time for that. I don't have time to do anything for God. Most of us do have time. We just have to have priorities because if, if we look at our lives most of us have time that we waste every day that we could give to God as a gift because we love him and because he's worthy of that then there's also our grasp that is our knowledge there are some things that some people know that I've never heard of <laughs> and, it, and it's not that I'm stupid it's that I've never learn that particular topic, that particular field of learning. There are things that I know that other people don't know. The knowledge that we have ought to be given to God as a gift so that he can use it for his glory and his honor. And then even our goals, our purposes in life. What is my purpose in life? Let's be honest. If you're a Christian, your purpose in life is bound up in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your purpose in life is not for you to accomplish all your goals. Your goals ought to be given to the Savior. And let him set your goals for you and what he wants of you. So let's let's be uh, kind of specific in what we're talking about. And in, in this application, what I'm doing is I'm just trying to relate to you in, in one way or another how to apply what we're talking about. So in church life, let's talk about church life. So... We came in this afternoon. See, I got it right. We came in this afternoon. And we started singing. You know, and, and everybody was singing. I knew everybody was singing because I could hear it. And, and that was a good thing. But uh, I've, I've seen in some places and I've heard of some places where during the congregational singing, there would be this group here and this group here. And they're carrying on their different com conversations. They're just talking about plans after church or, you know, whatever. But, but they're talking and laughing rather than singing and making melody in their heart unto the Lord, which is what they ought to be doing. In Psalm 95 and verse 1, it says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise unto the rock of our salvation. And then uh, we, we'll talk about special music. We haven't had a lot of special music. Uh, but the special music that we've had so far, I have, I've really enjoyed. I haven't had to do any of it. That's why I enjoy it so much. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> anyway, we, we have to remember uh, when it comes to special music, it's supposed to be special, not run-of-the-mill, right? Thus the name special. <laughs> Unless we want to talk about like special class and, and like that. But we're not talking about that. So in other words, let, let me give you this example. One church I was in where I was assistant pastor, uh, the song leader there, uh, he, he would know for six, eight weeks before that he was supposed to be singing a special Sunday morning when we have visitors and all that sort of thing. And so uh, we, we, had, uh, we had a church choir and the choir would come down just before the final song. While the choir's coming down, just before the final song, he's standing there flipping through the hymn book. What am I going to sing for a special? That is not special. <laughs> that is not giving to God what is your best. That, as far as I'm concerned, God's not pleased with. Because you haven't done your best for God. Um, you know the, the song, Give of Your Best to the Master. It's a good song. And uh, I, we've sung it a few times. And uh, we'll sing it more, I know, uh, because James is listening to me. And we'll sing it more, I know. Uh, but there, there's another song uh, that I don't believe is in our hymn book. It's, I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? And I tell you, especially when it comes to something when 
one individual or a group is going to stand before the church and present special music, we always ought to do our best for the Lord. In uh, 1 Chronicles 15, 22, it says, And Chenea, chief of the uh, Levites, was for song. He instructed about the song because he was skillful. What does that mean? It means he did his best. And because he did his best and he was skillful, he could even teach other people how to do their best and uh, progress that way. Then there's attention that's paid during the message. So sort of the idea of, uh, see, you don't see. I see. I stand up here. I have to look at you. And some of you, that's not, not a bad thing. I don't mind looking at some of you. And some of you, it's like, I just don't want to look over here. And I don't mean that necessarily for Ezra. Um, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm kidding about that. But sometimes you, you just feel like, ah, you know, they're mad about something or, you know, something's going on. Uh, but, but here's the thing. You've given of your time to come here, not to listen to me. If you think you came to hear me, uh, you got another thing coming. You should have come to hear from God. Amen. Amen. And I did not prepare a talk. Okay? That makes me mad when I hear people talk about a preacher giving a talk. No preacher gives a talk. A minister might. But no preacher of the gospel gives a talk. And, and I don't even like to use the term sermon either. Because a sermon gives the idea of something that is dry, something that is prepared, something that is, it's just in the book, and this is what we're supposed to do this week. I don't even like using that term. I use the term message. And the reason I use that term is because during the week, I pray, I study, and I ask God to give me a message that I can give to you. And so when you come, you shouldn't come to hear me, and you shouldn't come to be entertained because that's not going to happen. But you ought to come to hear a message from God. But the thing is, if you're sitting there and you're zoned out, or if you're sitting there texting back and forth, or if you're sitting there passing notes, you're not getting the message. You're wasting your time. That's no gift for the Savior. But if you're sitting paying attention and you're absorbing what God has for you through his message, that can be a gift for the Savior. Then, not only that, but there's the response to the message. And when we have our invitation, when we sing our final song, that is the time to be seriously contemplating the message we've heard. It's not a time to, to be looking around, okay, what are we going to do? Of course, you know, we don't have a morning service, so it can't be, what are we going to do for lunch? But what are we going to do for supper? You know, what are we going to, where are we going to go after this? What are we going to do? The invitation is not time for that. You're not giving anything to God during that time I'm just and I'm not saying there's been a problem with this I'm just giving you some examples uh, so let's go on and talk about everyday life and in everyday life we ought to put God first is this true or is this not true we ought to always put God first we know what Jesus said in Matthew 6 but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you so we ought to always put God first by spending time in prayer and spending time in reading the Bible. Now, I do not mean that we ought, every one of us, be up early in the morning reading our Bible. Because for some of us who are not morning people, getting up early in the morning reading our Bible does nothing for us. <laughs> nothing. Because believe me, I've tried it. Uh, when I was in Bible college, we had to get up 5.30 every morning. Now, you know, I'm not bragging about that. I would have changed it if it was up to me. Uh, but we were up 5.30 every morning, and we had to be reading our Bible. And then we had to make notes of everything we got out of the Bible. Look, I had to wake up while I was writing things. And then think, what was I writing? I don't know. You know, so I just write down. It was, it was stupid. It really was. Because I'm not built that way. I'm not built to do that. But what I mean by putting God first is you set aside a time this is when I'm going to spend time in the Word of God. This is when I'm going to spend time in prayer. And you don't let anything get in the way. You keep that where God is always first at that time. And then also expressing to others the character traits of a believer. Look, you know, being a Christian is more than just coming here and meeting and listening to a message from God. Being a Christian is much more than that. 
Being a Christian is an everyday activity. It is a lifestyle, to be very honest. Being a Christian is a culture in and of itself. And we ought to exemplify that Christian culture to everyone around us. In 1 Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 5, Peter says this, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we ought to express that uh, the character traits of a Christian to those who are around us. And look, as we're doing that, what are we doing? We're giving a gift to the Savior. Because we're saying, I am taking on myself these character traits that are not me. But I'm doing it because the King is worthy. And I'm doing it for him. And not only that, but just, just doing our best at every task that's given to us. Taking out the trash, cleaning the toilets, cooking, you know, washing up afterward. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says this, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Everything that we do, ought to be for the glory of God. And that, that's what Paul tells us. So everything that we do ought to be done as if it were a gift for the Savior. Think about that. Is there anything you're doing in your life that you would do differently if you realized that you were doing it as a gift for the Lord? Or maybe is there something in your life that you would stop doing if you realized that's a gift for the Lord? We ought to think about this. You see, we're coming down to Christmas time, and it's all about, would you get me? <laughs> you know, that's the way we think. But look, it's not my birthday. It's not your birthday. We are commemorating the birth of Christ. What are you giving the Savior this year? Let's stand together with our heads bowed, nice clothes. And let's